Good morning, Wall Street. Our first prelude today is Come Now is the Time to Worship.
Woohoo! Thank you. Praise God. From Psalm 104, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there. It's the summertime. Creeping things innumerable are all around us. Living things, both small and great. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let us come into this service of worship, praising our God, and let's stand and sing, Morning Has Broken. we do thank you for your creation. We thank you for your recreation, how you continually continue to create in this world and in our lives. And we pray that you would plant good things in us and help us to grow in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. I want to welcome everyone to our service of worship this morning. On behalf of myself and our awesome music team, I, I'm glad that you could be here to worship with us. Um, if uh, you want, you please join us after the service for a time of hot coffee, just what you need, and a time of refreshment at the back um, in Heritage Hall after our time of service. We always have an evening service. Tonight, our evening service, Louis Sani is speaking. And uh, I don't know what his message is. He uh, tends to, anyway, he's always got a great message. But, uh, so join us for that at 5.50 this evening. Um, this Wednesday, July 29th, uh, the People with AIDS, PWA, Friends for Life bike rally is coming through. If you've been in the area, you've probably seen this. It's, it's quite an amazing thing. They've been doing it for years riding bikes from Toronto to Montreal, going along, you know, the highway to the river side, and they always go through Brockville, and they ask for community people to come and encourage them on. And I think it's just an amazing thing they're doing, raising awareness for AIDS. And so our outreach committee is helping out to wave the flag and cheer, cheer on this crew. If you're able to, to help and uh, help out with that, talk to Chris uh, Dave Bremner. Hiya, caramba. I'm going to have to call you Christabel just so I get it straight. Wave, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Talk to Dave. Awesome. Um, if you happen to be in the church tomorrow, or even today, a sneak preview, our very own Kathy Kelso is turning 60. Woohoo! Woohoo! 
And she also just celebrated her ninth anniversary of surviving working in the office here at Wall Street United Church. So we wish you well, Kathy. Sure. to tell them how old you were turning, but, you know, I might as well celebrate it, right? <laughs> and uh, finally, last but very much not least, it is my great honor and privilege to announce to you that we have hired a new director of music at the church. And so Dr. Keith Hartshorn Walton will be joining us in September. He has a uh, doctorate of music performance degree from McGill University, and he's been working in a United Church, um, Ebenezer United Church, on the east end of our conference near Oshawa and Curtis uh, for, for the past few years. And so he's uh, moving east and uh, is delighted to join us and excited about all of the music talent that we have here. So he will be joining us in September. And uh, as we, uh, even as we prepare to welcome him, I'm so incredibly grateful for the music team that has stepped in uh, in this interim time. So just thank you so much for all who have, <laughs> who have helped. We don't have a kid's time, but the kids are welcome to go on out and uh, hang out in the nursery with, with uh, Linda and or Eileen. <laughs> So you guys can go on down now if you want. Do you want to go down to the nursery? Go now. So long, Move it. farewell, <laughs> I'll be there soon. Let's give Petra some Let's of that Let's stand dance and music. greet one another sharing signs of peace. Give her some of that dance music, Lise. Go make a difference. Play Go Make a Difference for Petra. Kathy, this is a tough act to follow. The scripture reading, can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, the scripture reading this morning is taken from uh, Matthew 13, verses 24 through 35. <clears throat> Jesus then told them this story. The kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a farmer scattered good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and scattered weed seeds in the field and then left. When the plants came up and began to ripen, the farmer's servants could see the weeds. 
The servants came and asked, Sir, didn't you scatter good seed in this field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. His servants then asked, Do you want us to go out and pull all the weeds up? No, he answered. You might also pull up the wheat. Leave the weeds alone until harvest time. Then I'll tell my workers to gather the weeds and tie them up and burn them. But I'll have them store the wheat in my barn. Jesus told them another story. The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a farmer plants a mustard seed in the field. Although it is the smallest of all weeds, it grows larger than any garden plant and becomes a tree. Birds even come to nest on its branches. Jesus also said, the kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a woman mix, mixes a, a little yeast into three big batches of flour. Finally, all the dough rises. Jesus used stories when he spoke to the people. In fact, he did not tell them anything without using stories. So God's promise came true just as the prophet had said. I will use stories to, peak my, to speak my message and explain things that have hidden, have been hidden since the creation of the world. In this reading, we hear God's voice. Thanks be to God. Our prayer song this morning is All Who Are Thirsty. We invite you to remain seated and uh, pray through music.
continue to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being here in our presence. Holy Spirit, we feel you here among us. We pray that you would come and that you would work in our lives, that you would dig in our hearts and in our souls and help to grow good things, that you would bring healing to the parts of us that are hurting, whether they be hurting physically or emotionally from past hurts, Come and bring healing into our lives, into our church, into our community. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray for those who have requested our prayers, and we bring before you Bill Borger, Annie Healy, Ed and Harriet Maloney. We also bring before you three-week-old Philip and 101-year-old Dorothea Coates. We know how much you love all of your people, all of your creation. In a moment of silence, let us bring before God those we know, perhaps it's ourselves, who are in need of a special blessing, a special prayer this morning. We gather our prayers we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to share your love and your light in the community. We gather our prayers together as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. join us in the response to the offertory. In the bulb there is a flower.
Let's pray. Holy God, be near to us this morning, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, hands up. How many of Doctor Who fans? Oh, there's a few more than I thought. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so uh, for those of you who aren't, you know, I know you've all heard of Doctor Who, but for those of you who aren't, you know, really connected, it's a television series that started in 1963 in, in England. Doctor Who is, a, um, is from a dead planet, and uh, he travels around in his eternity. He's from another, you know, he can live eternally kind of thing. And he travels around through time and space, going to different planets in a spaceship called the TARDIS. The TARDIS on the outside looks like a 1960s British police box. It's much bigger and nicer on the inside. Actually, the TARDIS was supposed to be able to uh, change shape to be any sort of very common uh, thing, that it would just blend into the environment wherever it landed, but the TARDIS has a bit of a glitch, and so it's always a 1960s British police box. Um, blue. It's blue. <laughs> anyway, we'll duke it out. <laughs> Some of them, I know what you mean, I can picture red ones, but the TARDIS is very definitely blue. Um, okay, anyway, so uh, <laughs> the doctor is also able to regenerate his body when he, gets, uh, when he gets too old or he gets wounded. And they're now on the 12th doctor, regenerated doctor. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to just regenerate? I mean, what, what number would you be on by now? Don't bother answering. Anyway, they, they had a recent episode. Um, it, the Doctor Who was relaunched in 2005, and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the relaunch, they had a special episode that aired in select theaters in Canada. And this is a little clip that they showed before that episode in theaters. Okay, and cue him? I am cueing him. Well, cue him again. Doctor! Oh! Is it me? Yes, now! Hello, everyone! Oh. Oh, well, that is a bit disappointing. Aha! Hey! There you are! Oh, brilliant. Hello, welcome to the 100th anniversary special of Doctor Who in 12D! Hey! No, really? Oh, sorry, oops, it's in 3D. What's good about that? Is there a budget car? That is. Sorry about that, bit confused time travel. You see, I've just watched the 100th anniversary special. All 57 doctors still, you know, 3D. That's good too. Which reminds me, actually, time to activate your 3D spectacles. Please prepare to initialize your facial furniture. On the count of three, ready? A one, a two, a three, put them on. Hurrah! Now, before we enter the third dimension, which frankly is travelling slowly by my standards, a safety check. There are Zygons in the building. Sorry about that, but there are. And they're very hungry Zygons, dying for a snack, as some of you will be shortly if you're not quick. Now, as you know, as all of you know, Zygons can disguise themselves as people, so we don't know which of you are real and which of you are alien monsters dying for their dinner. Fortunately, we've fitted out your spectacles with Zygon detectors. Everybody turn and look at the person next to you. Hey, hey, yes, that's right. So stare at each other right in the spectacles. Everybody find a staring partner. Now, please, hello, hello, it's a hungry alien emergency. Now, to activate your Zygon detector, just close one eye, like this. All do that now. Great. Now. Look at the spectacles opposite you. If one of the lenses has turned black, that person is really a Zygon and is going to eat you at some point during the movie. <laughs> Please, don't panic. It will only disturb everyone else and there's really nothing we can do to save you. OK, everybody, eyes front. It's time to go 3D. Brace yourselves.
I apologize that we didn't have enough Zygon detectors here for you. But the reason I showed that clip, you've probably figured out that uh, if whenever you have 3D glasses, if you put them on and close one eye and look at somebody else in, three, in 3D glasses, one eye will always, you'll always see one eye being black. You can try that trick the next time you're going to see a, a 3D uh, movie. So every person in that theater saw Zygon next to them, right? Zygons, uh, as, as the doctor said, uh, have shape-shifting abilities, so they can disguise themselves as any kind of creature. In, uh, in their natural form, they're incredibly hideous, and they're very vicious as well. So you certainly, uh, you certainly don't want to come up against a Zygon or be sitting next to a Zygon in your pew. Look around. You never know. All right, let's shift from Zygons to Jesus. I think that should have been my sermon title, but anyway. In our parable, in our scripture reading this morning that Ted read, uh, we, got, we were given parables. Um, Jesus spoke in parables and he told, he wanted to describe the kingdom of God, which of course, until our time comes to pass from life through death into the fullness of of the kingdom of God, we're not going to know fully what it's like. But Jesus wants us to understand it, because the kingdom of God is not in another space-time continuum. The kingdom of God is all around us. We're, our job is to have open eyes and open ears to see the kingdom around us, and to, and to help to with God, sort of co-creators to grow the kingdom of God around us. Um, In the first parable, it was the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And in this parable, the, uh, the owner of the farm plants good seed, he plants wheat. But then as it's growing up, the laborers notice that there's weeds all through, all through the wheat. In uh, the scriptures in the King James Version, they used to call it the the parable of the wheat and the tares. And uh, the the tares is another word more commonly known as as darnel. And it looked a lot like wheat. Until the ears come up, it's very difficult to distinguish what is this very toxic weed and what is wheat. So the master says, no, don't uproot them. Wait until they're fully grown to rip out the weeds. But it just seems that that's so typical of weeds, isn't it? I mean, I know even just this summer I had my, uh, my sister-in-law over to look at a patch of, you know, leafy things to say, what is this? These are weeds, right? And she said, well, why don't you take most of them out but leave a couple just to see? And I'm glad I'm glad she gave me that advice because it, they turned out to be uh, purple cone flowers. So I'm hoping that next uh, year I'll remember that they're not weeds, that they are in fact lovely flowers. But it's just so typical. I think the best weeds seem to do a good job of disguising themselves as plants, right? Um, I, I've heard some great advice. Um, one woman says, when weeding, the best way to make sure you're removing a weed and not a valuable plant is to pull on it. If you pull on it and it comes out of the ground easily, it's a valuable plant. (laughs) And another one, to distinguish flowers from weeds, simply pull everything up, and what comes back are weeds. Yeah. But wouldn't it be nice to weed people? Come on. You know, it's not just me. We all have people that we'd love to just kind of weed out, right? You know, if it wasn't for that one person in the family, if it wasn't for that person in the office, not you, Kathy, if it wasn't for that coworker or landlord or boss or, or, or that friend, we all have people in our lives that for whatever reason are incredibly difficult, perhaps even toxic, that we just wish if that person weren't there, we imagine that everything would be so much better. But as the Franciscan friar Richard Rohr would say, as, as humans we tend to be very dualistic thinkers. We tend to think in good 
and bad, black and white, light and dark. We, we like that dualism. So we like to say, well, this person's good. I see them recycling, mowing their lawn, and volunteering in the community. They're good. Well, that person's bad. Did you see that that person smokes? Or whatever your, you know? We tend to be very dualistic in our thinking. But the truth is, the wheat and the weeds are intermingled, not just in the field, and not just outside. It's not just zygons here and there. They're intermingled inside of us. There are zygonesque parts of us. We, the kingdom of God, instead of being either or, white or black, is a lot more yes and. We are both sinners and saints. We are both good and bad. And of course, our task is to grow and nurture the good and to help to weed out that garden a little bit. But we have to accept both outside of us and inside of us that there is both. How many of you read a few years ago, or maybe recently, The Shack? You remember that book? It was written by a Canadian author, William P. Young. It's a fictional story of a man named Mac. Mac goes back to a place of incredibly deep, deep pain, the place where his youngest daughter was murdered. He goes back to this, this shack, this place, and doesn't see anything there, but then as he turns to leave, the scene is supernaturally transformed. And all of a sudden, things are lush and vibrant and full of color. And so he turns around and goes back into the shack. And there he meets God. He meets God embodied in three people. Uh, God the Father is there, who is uh, embodied as a black African-American woman named Elusia. And then there is Jesus, who is there embodied as a Jewish carpenter. And then the Holy Spirit is also there embodied as an, an Asian woman named Sereyu. Um, and at one point in the story, uh, Sereyu, the Holy Spirit, asks Matt to help her in her garden. And Mac goes to the garden, and he's expecting, you know, perfection. He's expecting a beautifully manicured garden. And when he gets there, it's a whole crazy kind of mess. I mean, there's vegetables right next to the fruit, and there's flowers, and, and all sorts of things, trees. It's just everything here and there kind of willy-nilly. And he, he's surprised by this, and she gets him to help dig out some roots and move things around. And after a while, Sarayu reveals to him the secret, the secret that the garden is actually Mac. She says, Mac, this garden is your soul. This mess is you. Mac is a mess because of the pain in his life. He's a mess also because he grew up in an abusive home. In fact, the author said that the title of the book is a metaphor, a metaphor for the house you build out of your own pain. The shack, he said, is a metaphor for the places you get stuck, you get hurt, you get damaged, the thing where shame or hurt is centered. And so that day in that messy garden, the Holy Spirit explains to Mac, together you and I, we have been working with a purpose in your heart. And it is wild and beautiful and perfectly in process. To you, this seems like a mess. But to me, I see a perfect pattern emerging and growing and alive. I often I think of the children's stories that Stuart has shared a couple of times where he brings out one of those tapestry um, and how on, on the one side it's a beautiful picture, but on the back side 
it's you can't see the picture it's a mess of of little threads and colors and you can't see it that's what we're like the hurts in our lives the things that life has thrown at us create a lot of of messiness but God sees purpose and God sees where that mess can be turned into something incredibly beautiful if we let it happen. One day, this kingdom of God on earth, this messy life of mine and yours, one day perfection will come. One day, Zygons will be bygones. You see, in the same way that there's no room for fear in the perfect love of God, there's no room for that which is imperfect in God's kingdom. When that time comes for us to pass from life through death into eternal life, all that is imperfect in us will be refined, burned away, and not in a, you know, judgment, wrath of God kind of way, but in a, that's just the way it is. When you turn a light on in a dark room, the darkness disappears. One day, the perfect will come. One day, the complete will come, as it talks about in Corinthians 13. One day, the partial will come to an end. But for now, our job is to invite God into our messy souls, our messy hearts, to invite God in to help work on that garden, to help grow and nourish the beauty that is inside of us, the purpose that God sees inside us, and to allow God to work on the stuff that isn't so pretty. And our job um, uh, our job, for the most part, is to work on ourselves. There are people, there are special people, who have a calling to help remove weeds in other people's hearts. And actually, on August 9th, um, Reverend Joan Stinson is going to be at our church in the evening for the evening service. She's a United Church minister who is now working full-time doing counseling, uh, and in particular, she helps people find emotional healing. And uh, I, I've gone to see Joan, um, and that's why I invited her to come, because I have a, a lot of respect for her. So if you've got some past hurts, if you've got um, symptoms of hurts, like a lot of negativity or anger or depression, um, sadness, whatever just kind of keeps coming up and choking the good, come out on August 9th in the evening because you just might find she's one of these people who is called to help work on the weeds in other people's garden. But most of us are called not to worry about other people's weeds. You can work on your own, but we're called not to judge others. We're called like the workers with the master, and the master said, no, 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 leave them alone. Let them grow up together because there's a lot of risk when you're working on other people's weeds that you're going to cause more damage than good, both to yourself and to them. So in the meantime, while we wait for the perfect to come, our call is to plant seeds and not pull weeds. Our call is to nurture little seedlings that are growing to make a difference in our church, in our community, and in the world, to be co-creators with our wonderful, loving God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, good grief. <laughs> You're just stirring the pot, buddy. <laughs>
For seeds of love, seeds of hope, seeds of joy. Let's go from this place and create with our God a beautiful world. And may the blessings of God, the source of love, of Christ Jesus, the love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, love's power, go with you today and forevermore. Amen. Let's reach out and grab a hand or a shoulder as we sing Go Now in Peace.